God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. God is good. All the time. Good morning. If you do not get your communion emblem things, whatever you call them, elements, I guess, uh, they're on the table in the back. If you didn't get one, please go get them now. I always forget to say that, so I don't want to get out of the way. Just a couple of announcements before we get into our worship. We are down a few people this morning because they are some of them are traveling, but we picked up a few people because they, they're up there traveling. So, uh, we uh, appreciate everyone being here. If you are visiting with us, please fill out one of the visitors' cards on the seat in front of you. And uh, Caitlin and Josh and Cairo came up Friday night as a surprise and uh, helped them out with some projects they had. And, appreciate that and uh, I'm sure they it was a big surprise for them so they'll be traveling back this afternoon I understand so uh, your safety and it's good, always good to have them with us uh, Kay and Don Watson are in uh, Savannah Tennessee they will return tomorrow they're down the scene Cromwell's and, uh, coming back with a report I'm sure so uh, appreciate them going there for that our condolences uh, to brother David his grandmother passed away um, the other evening, and um, the viewing and all of that is tomorrow. David and Bella will be leaving right after services to head back down to uh, the Columbus area, down to Reynoldsburg. So our sympathies continue uh, for that. It was a very, very close relationship. So uh, please uh, accept our condolences. Um, as of now, I am still uh, scheduled for an MRI August the 4th. I have no other updates until that comes done, and then we'll, we'll see what happens after that. So, uh, leadership meeting today at 4 o'clock. Uh, David won't be here, so we're going to talk about him a lot. <laughs> and, uh, but he, he has given me his list of things he wants to go over. I'm going to add a few <laughs> and blame it on him. So, uh, so that, please remember, 4 o'clock this afternoon here at the building. Also, if you haven't seen the railings going up and down the steps, uh, they're very, very much used and appreciated. Uh, thank those guys for, for doing that. You might have noticed pulling in that the sign that we have uh, decided to get is uh, in the process of being put together. The electricity was run for it, and now there's other things that need to be done. So there are some, some construction things going on, so be careful if you're out there. And, don't do like I do and run into things like upright poles and conduit, things like that. I do it all the time. So. We have a lot of things going on uh, with the, uh, the congregation, so make sure you look at those things. Ladies, uh, you need to meet immediately following the services. Uh, if you can, real quick, uh, this Saturday we are having a celebration of life for Amber Harvey's father, Mike Crano. And uh, we are, uh, the church is providing a lot of the uh, food and things, so. If you have any questions, uh, see Joe, but ladies, uh, you are asked to stay after a little bit up here, Barbara, this is right here, right here in front, and yeah, please. And, uh, the celebration of life is Saturday the 31st from 1 to 3 here at the building, so I appreciate all the work going into that. There's a lot of other things in here. Make sure you look at all of that, and we'll get into our worship this morning. This pen, or I'm going to pick it up and use it as a remote. <laughs> that wouldn't be good. <clears throat> Hope this works. <clears throat> you have come to Mount Zion, to the General Assembly and Church of the Firstborn in Jesus. We shall assemble on the mountain. We shall assemble at the
is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. <clears throat>
Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for letting us be able to, be able to come here to sing praises and worship you. Please be with those who are dealing with loss, like with uh, Dave and his grandmother and my wife with her father. Please be with them, give them strength, and help them lean on your wisdom to help get through these difficult times. Also, please be with David, for he's about to speak another uh, from your word, another lesson from your word. Um, help him uh, get everything he needs to get out so uh, we can use the words from your uh, from the Bible that he's going to be speaking about today to go out to the world to better serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And the crucified with Christ is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And in life I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We'll sing this song. Prepare our minds for the Lord's table this morning. <clears throat> King of my life, I crown thee now, thy shall the glory be. Bless thy forgiveness, thy glory tell you this morning my week you know we're supposed to give thanks for the good and the bad both and we're running way behind on making hay so I thought last 
Sunday evening, I just go home and I fuel up the tractor and grease the conditioner. I can start conditioning. I can was prepared to condition until midnight if I had to. So we got all hooked up and I kind of flopped down in the seat put her in gear and I made it about a hundred feet below her. So I looked back and right away I knew that she was done. There'd be a couple of days of downtime some expense to it. And I looked and I couldn't be mad because when I looked back the gearbox looked like the toaster whenever you burn toast, you know, and it's smoking. Wobble block was just smoking like a toaster. So I had to laugh instead of be mad. But I got her going after a couple days and I didn't, when I was working, I was thinking, you know, I should have been thankful that I had the means to buy the parts and I had the knowledge to hammer that bearing off of there and put the new stuff together and get it back going. And I didn't acknowledge, you know, that I was thankful she blowed up. Yeah, okay. And we got it back together and it was about six o'clock and I started out and went to the end and rounded the corner and I hadn't been back and looked at them cows for about two weeks because of the hay and you'd have to go through three gates to get back there so I neglected looking at them and I went down and rounded the corner and looked over and there was two little white specks in the field. The calves when they're born are just white as snow. So I did have something to be thankful for. I give thanks for the cows, but I didn't just sit back and give thanks for the bad time when the gearbox blew. So hopefully you can think of that. Let's give thanks for this emblem of Christ's body upon the cross. Our Lord of heaven, we thank you that through your son and the sacrifice and the terrible loss you would have experienced in losing your son and the benefit we have this morning come before you and we look upon this emblem and remember it and appreciate much more what you have done for us and we pray in Jesus name Assembling of Christ's blood. Our Lord of heaven, we thank you that we can take this emblem to remember the actual sacrifice and the death of your Son upon the cross, the burial, and the resurrection, and the benefit. We have to enjoy. And we all just give thanks. Be appreciative and remember these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
we complete this more of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, and we move on to the collection. We have been blessed and now able to give a portion back support of the church, spreading the word, the programs that we undertake here. Let's give thanks to the word of prayers. Our Lord of heaven, we here come before you as we have gathered. We thank you that we have the means put it back what we have allotted. We thank you, Lord, that as each of us comes in from a different home, that we may gather here, we may gather together to praise your name and the songs and learn of your lesson and go back, take it into the community in our homes and locations. We thank you now, Lord, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Thou art worthy, O Lord, to see glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Would you please stand as we sing this song? We may stand in the scripture reading of the fall. Chapter 14, 
verses 3 through 9. Mark 14, 3 through 9. But while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at the table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, Why was the ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor, and they scolded her. But Jesus said, Leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you will always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in her memory. Please be seated. Good morning, church. I want to first thank you all for your uh, your condolences to my wife and I and the loss of my grandmother. Um, it hurts. It's still fresh. Uh, but like we learned at the, the Widowhood Workshop, don't waste your pain. And so what I'd like to do this morning is, though it's, it's painful uh, to be speaking right now uh, because it's, it's just so fresh, I don't want to waste the opportunity to impress upon everyone here the importance of the gospel. Why it must be believed and why you should never take it for chance and never to leave any of your loved ones wondering, did they really believe it and obey it? Don't do that to your loved ones. Whether you're older or younger, don't leave it up to chance and don't leave anyone questioning whether you were a child of God or not. Don't let that happen. We want Jesus to be Lord of all. Lord over ourselves, Lord over our lives, Lord over our families, our country, over all of the world, as we've just sang. This morning in John chapter 12, we're going to see a beautiful portrait of someone making Jesus just that. If you have your Bibles with you, I'd invite you to open up to John chapter 12. We'll be working through the first 11 verses this morning. This morning. You'll be happy to know that we've made it to a new chapter. We've made it through John chapter 11, which was a great chapter about the raising of Lazarus from the dead. What a marvelous thing that is. For those of us who are in Christ to be able to look forward to that day, all the loved ones that we've lost who are in Christ will be raised to eternal life. That's what we, it's going to be marvelous. After raising Lazarus from the dead, many people believed in him. And many people were hostile towards him because of it. We saw that the Pharisees after that had planned very hard for Jesus' death. They were, they were committed to getting rid of him at that point. Jesus' popularity grew more and more after this event, and so did that of Lazarus. Look down at verses 9 through 11 with me. When a large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came, not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests plan made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. They wanted to destroy the evidence. Jesus was gaining so much popularity, and Lazarus was hoping they wanted to just get rid of them both. At this point in time, Jesus' public ministry was done. He's no longer out in the crowds and working the crowds and, and teaching all these vast numbers of people and performing all of these signs. That, that chapter has wrapped up. Now his focus is on preparing his disciples and those whom he is closest with for what was coming, his death, namely. And so our passage this morning I want to say showcases two very different perspectives. Different perspectives about Jesus, who he is, what his mission was. Perspectives about what is really most important and is of what is of the most value in this life and in this world. And this passage also showcases motivations. Namely, true and genuine sacrificial love. 
versus selfishness and greed. So as we begin to get into our text this morning in verse 1, we're going to see a few things that I'd like to go through very quickly. In verse 1, six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. We're given a time stamp. And this time stamp, time stamp is important because it gives us how close we are to this actual crucifixion and everything that Jesus was going to endure. We're just six days out from this world-changing event. We're in the final week of Jesus' life prior to his crucifixion. We're given the location for where this event takes place. Our text here says he was just with Lazarus. But other gospel accounts identify the house as that of Simon the leper. Simon the leper. I think that's interesting. They didn't have the meal in Lazarus, Mary, and Martha's house. They had it with Simon the le leper. And one commentator noted the significance of this. You see, when somebody had lepros leprosy in this day and age, it didn't just get better. Things didn't just naturally improve when you got that particular disease. And so the fact that they were having dinner at Simon the leper's house meant Simon somehow got over his leprosy. He wasn't an outcast from the city anymore, so who do you suppose changed his situation? I think it's probably Jesus had something, had something to do with that. Because Simon was now an ex-leper, apparently. And so we, Jesus, we see Jesus in a place surrounded by loved ones, God knows that he has had a significant impact in their lives. Move on to verse 2. The scene continues. The men are gathered together, reclining at the table. And good old Martha, she's, she's serving up supper. you, you got to love a Martha. You, everybody knows a Martha. Other accounts tell us that Martha was actually rather frustrated at this point in time because Mary wasn't helping her get this food on the table. She wasn't helping in the serving, and so Mary was frustrated. And so we have to wonder, all right, where is Mary? What's she doing? What is she up to? In verse 3, tells us what Mary was doing. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. One pound of highly valued Ointment. Judas estimates the cost of this in verse 5 to be about 300 denarii. For us, that'd be about one year's wages. Now just stop and think about that for a second. Whatever you've ever made in a year, whether you're working or retired or whatever, the, the amount of expense in buying this particular object, this, this ointment, is astronomical. Nobody here would, would purchase something of that value, spend an entire year's wages on, on this one particular item. That's it's just crazy to think about. And she took this highly valuable item and anointed the feet of Jesus with it. Anointed his feet. And she wiped his feet with her hair. This ointment, being expensive as it was, was perhaps a family heirloom. If somebody puts such a great investment into something, a lot of times that's something that's passed down from generation to generation. Perhaps it was a, a family heirloom. We don't know. We don't, do know that this ointment was often used in the burial process. But I think it's interesting that it wasn't used for Lazarus. Whatever that is, I don't know. It's something that was apparently very precious and valuable to the family. And she used it on Jesus' feet. Jesus' feet. Foot washings were performed oftentimes in this culture. You walked on these dirty roads all day and you came into the house. You didn't want to track the dirt and who knows what else that you have on your feet through the house. And so somebody, usually the lowest person in the house, whether that's a slave or a servant or whatever, had the job of cleaning everybody's feet as they came into the house. And she takes this role upon herself. We have this poor woman with this valuable ointment taking on this role of a servant. 
She stoops down to Jesus' feet to perform this task, washes who knows what kind of filth off of his feet. And then she goes one step further and wipes his feet clean with her hair. Just take a moment and think about that mental picture. First off, it was, it was culturally unacceptable for a woman to let her hair down in this day and age. They wore their head coverings, they had their hair hidden, they weren't to let it down in such a way, especially in front of company. Yet Mary did. Remember this, that a woman's hair was also her glory. Her glory. She used her glory to wipe clean the feet of Jesus. Talk about an example of humility and devotion. And could you do it? Would you and I be able to lower ourselves to that extent, to give up something of such incredible value, to clean what would be considered the lowest and most filthy part of Jesus' body, stoop down and wipe them clean with our hair? It's incredible to think about how much humility and devotion is just in this one act. I think that if we saw Jesus for who he really is, the glorious Lord of all creation, that we would be compelled to do so. Not because he's forcing us to do it, but simply standing in awe of who he is, that we would, we would have no other choice but to bow down before him and do this very same thing, given the opportunity. I want to mention this as well, speaking about anointings. Anointings took place before the coronation of a king. We've been learning about this for a while now in Joe's Sunday school class, where kings, before they assumed their kingship, would be anointed with oil to declare them as king. Now Mary anointed Jesus' body in preparation with his burial, as verse 7 says. But I want for us to take a, a moment and notice where this particular event falls within the greater timeline of Jesus' remaining life before the cross. We're just a few days away from Jesus' triumphal entry into the city. A short time away. We're a short time away from him receiving his crown of thorns. We're a short time away from him mockingly being called the king of the Jews. And after which, after his crucifixion, he rises victoriously over death and assumes his heavenly throne from which he now reigns. I can't prove it, but I think this is his anointing as king. It sure fits the timeline. But regardless of that, we see this beautiful picture of humility, of love, of service, true discipleship. But it doesn't stay that way in our text, does it? If you look further down in verse 4, we're greeted with these words. But Judas, but Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, <clears throat> there's a contrast about to be made here. And I want to make, make a note of what's mentioned about Judas. One of the disciples who was about to betray him. This is a title that you would never want to have associated with your name. To be somebody who was devoted to the Lord at some point in time, but decided, no thanks, that's not for me anymore, and stop following him and betray him. It's important we know this because it's still very possible to do. People do it all the time. Perhaps you know somebody who was a devout Christian, as, or so it seemed, and then one day they decided, that's really not that important to me anymore. It's not really my thing. I'd rather do what it is that I want to do than what God wants me to do. The contrast continues where we see Judas's response to this incredible act of genuine love for Jesus. Look at verses 5 and 6 with me. Judas said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what's put into it. 
how does Jesus respond to this great act of genuine love towards Jesus? He, he responds with criticism. He's critical of it. The other, the other gospel of Mark, why was it wasted like that? A waste? A waste to love Jesus? His mind is not concerned about how important Jesus is. Nor is it concerned really with the well-being of the poor, which as verse 6 told us. Now this money bag that's mentioned here contained the funds accumulated for the purpose of helping the poor. That was the point of having this money bag. It wasn't just to provide for their own means, but they also helped the poor from that same, that same purse. So what Jesus, Judas is su suggesting is they should sell that, fill the money bag, and then he get paid. That's essentially what we're looking at. Now it's likely that Judas initially followed Jesus as the Messiah, with a misconception of who the Messiah would be and what he would do. It was very commonly thought that the Messiah was going to be this conquering king who would come in and kick out the Romans and they'd, they'd be a sovereign nation once again without the oppression of, of anybody else, any other nation. And so Judas, hearing that Jesus, oh, this, this must be the Messiah, followed him. But it turns out Jesus wasn't who Judas was wanting. Being close to the Messiah would mean that Judas would have had great power and money and influence. But he wasn't the Messiah he was looking for. That's not the case. The text also tells us that Judas had charge over this money bag. This tells us that he was trusted by the group. There was nothing to tip them off to say that there was something wrong with Judas. He just looked like one of the gang. He had charge of it. He was trusted with it. Outwardly, everything just looked fine. But inwardly, there was a very bad losing battle going on. A very bad losing battle going on. How easy is it for us to become a Judas? We like to throw him under the bus and say, I'd never be like that. I can't believe Judas would do such a thing after spending all of that time with him, after seeing all that he had seen. But I'll tell you this, it's easy to become a Judas. We often put up a front, like Judas did, where we lead people to believe that everything is fine. There's nothing wrong with us. There's nothing going on inside of us that we're, we're struggling with. How often do we do that? <clears throat> How often do we rob the Lord and rob our fellow disciples of what we should all be sharing? When we're keeping our talents and our abilities and the things we have to offer and bring to the table to ourselves, we rob God in that way. We rob our fellow disciples in that way. How easy is it to become a Judas? about this one? I hate to admit it, but sometimes I can be critical. Can you relate? Sometimes I can be critical of the things that people do out of genuine love for the Lord because I have a different perspective and oftentimes a wrong perspective on something. I see what they're doing and I say, what in the world are they doing that for? That doesn't make any sense. That they could do something. Why aren't they doing this? That's better. What I'm doing in that moment is I'm robbing them. And I'm robbing God the opportunity for them to express genuine love. Because they're not doing it my way. Can you relate? I'm sure we all can. Let's not rob the Lord in that way. And let's not rob somebody of the opportunity to love the Lord in that way. So we close out the scene this morning, verses 7 and 8. Jesus sets Judas and the other disciples who had chimed in and, and agreed. He sets them straight. Let's look at this together. Jesus said, Leave her alone, so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. 
There are times when we need to reprioritize and put first things first. We have to have a biblical perspective on our lives and on the world. And when we're part of the world and we're caught up in just daily life, it's easy to get things out of priority. Sometimes we put our friends and family and, and relationships above the relationship that's more important. Sometimes we put our, our jobs and our work above the work that the Lord has called us to do as his people. It's not to say that we are, are to be lazy or forsake those things, but put them in their proper place. We need to put first things first. And this was one of those times in which his disciples needed to be reminded of that. And we need to be reminded of it. Remember, as part of their mission to care for the poor. There, there was some legitimate concern there, though Judas had his own motivation for it. It's their mission to care for the poor as it is ours. But in that moment, they needed to be focused on Jesus alone. I want to say this as well. No amount of caring for the poor, selling things and giving the proceeds to the church, or any good work for that matter, amounts to anything unless Jesus is the priority of our lives. They're all vain exercises without Jesus. Mary made Jesus the priority in this moment. She loved him and submitted herself to him. Judas made himself the priority. He loved himself and the things that he aspired to above all else. So I want to ask us all this morning, who do we love more? It's easy for us to say, yes, we love the Lord more than anything else. But how does that play out in your life? Be genuine with yourself and ask yourself this difficult question. Do you love yourself or the Lord more? I want us to ask this as well. Do you have a heart like Mary's? You approach the Lord with great humility and are compelled to serve Him just because of who He is and not because of any other reason, anything you think you might gain for Him, just simply because He is Lord. Or are you critical like Judas? Are you critical? Do you unintentionally rob the Lord of love expressed by others with your criticisms? Let's be mindful of that. Do we live a life that betrays Jesus and everything that he's done for us? If you've been stumbling in this way, and you know you have, and you want to get right, you want to repent of those things and put priorities where they need to be, we want to help you with that. We want to pray with you and love you and support you as you make those changes. And if you're not yet a Christian, and you need to be baptized for the remission of your sins, that you can be united with Christ in his death and raise up a new creation. We can help you with that as well. If there's anything you need, please come forward as we stand. <laughs> Oh.
services, uh, meet in the front seat so we can have uh, flowers and things for the uh, celebration for uh, Amber's father. Also, I want to say this till now, uh, Butch uh, sent us a card, says to the Dover Church, thanks to everyone who came to Ned Betty's for my birthday party. Thank you, Butch. More, more than welcome. Had a, a wonderful time and met a lot of great people up there yesterday. We had met before. We really had a, a good time talking to a lot of them. So you have a lot of good friends, too. <laughs> so, we appreciated uh, the, the invitation. So, uh, thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, Bella had said something to me that she likes the song as the deer, and uh, she said, "I don't think we've sung it since we've been here." I said, "I can't believe that." You know, but, uh, we're going to sing it today. So, have a good day, men. Don't forget, <coughs> Elms Deacons, don't forget. I have a meeting at four o'clock here at the building, so a lot of things to go over and discuss uh, as we move forward with a lot of ideas. So. I can't read that. <coughs> How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty, my soul longs and even faints for you. For here my heart is satisfied within your presence. I sing beneath the shadow of your wings. That's the song that we're closing for. <coughs> <coughs> service this morning is pleasing to you. We thank you for the message that draws us even closer to you. As we leave this place, watch over us, continue to guide us and lead us. We ask your blessings upon David and Bella and also on the Sigalskis as they travel. Hold them in your hands and keep them safe. 
We thank you most importantly for Jesus, for his love, for his obedience and his courage and his strength. And we pray that as we grow closer to you, that we would also develop those attributes. Open our hearts and our minds and our tongues so that we may be better able to speak to those around about us about your love and your grace and your mercy. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.